Welcome to Horror Babble. Continuing our second volume of When Horror Meets Science Fiction this week is a short story by American author Philip K. Dick by the name of Tony and the Beatles. The tale tells of a boy who has befriended the native inhabitants of an alien planet conquered by human beings, but his relationship with the beetle-like creatures is about to be tested. We hope you enjoy this one. Tony and the Beatles by Philip K. Dick Reddish-yellow sunlight filtered through the thick quartz windows into the sleep compartment. Tony Rossi yawned, stirred a little, then opened his black eyes and sat up quickly. With one motion, he tossed the covers back and slid to the warm metal floor. He clicked off his alarm clock and hurried to the closet. It looked like a nice day. The landscape outside was motionless, undisturbed by winds or dust shift. The boy's heart pounded excitedly. He pulled his trousers on, zipped up the reinforced mesh, struggled into his heavy canvas shirt, and then sat down on the edge of the cot to tug on his boots. He closed the seams around their tops and then did the same with his gloves. Next, he adjusted the pressure on his pump unit and strapped it between his shoulder blades. He grabbed his helmet from the dresser, and he was ready for the day. In the dining compartment, his mother and father had finished breakfast. Their voices drifted to him as he clattered down the ramp. A disturbed murmur. He paused to listen. What were they talking about? Had he done something wrong again? And then he caught it. Behind their voices was another voice, static and crackling pops. The all-system audio signal from Rigel 4. They had it turned up full blast, the dull thunder of the monitor's voice boomed loudly. The war, always the war. He sighed and stepped out into the dining compartment. Morning, his father muttered. Good morning, dear, his mother said absently. She sat with her head turned to one side, wrinkles of concentration webbing her forehead. Her thin lips were drawn together in a tight line of concern. His father had pushed his dirty dishes back and was smoking, elbows on the table, dark hairy arms, bare and muscular. He was scowling, intent on the jumbled roar from the speaker above the sink. H How's it going? Tony asked. He slid into his chair and reached automatically for the ersatz grapefruit. Any news from Orion? Neither of them answered. They didn't hear him. He began to eat his grapefruit. Outside, beyond the little metal and plastic housing unit, sounds of activity grew. Shouts and muffled crashes as rural merchants and their trucks rumbled along the highway toward Carnot. The reddish daylight swelled. Beetlejuice was rising quietly and majestically. Nice day, Tony said. No flux wind. I think I'll go down to the end quarter a while. We're building a neat spaceport. A model, of course, but we've been able to get enough materials to lay out strips for— with a savage snarl, his father reached out and struck. The audio roar immediately died. I knew it. He got up and moved angrily away from the table. I told them it would happen. They shouldn't have moved so soon. Should have built up Class A supply bases first. Isn't our main fleet moving in from Bellatrix? Tony's mother fluttered anxiously. According to last night's summary, the worst that can happen is Orion 9 and 10 will be dumped. Joseph Rossi laughed harshly. The hell with last night's summary. I know as well as I do what's happening. What's happening? Tony echoed, as he pushed aside his grapefruit and began to ladle out dry cereal. Are we losing the battle? Yes! His father's lips twisted. Earthman losing to... to beetles. I told them, but they couldn't wait. My God, there's ten good years left in the system. Why'd they have to push on? Everybody knew Orion would be tough. The whole damn beetle fleet strung out around there, waiting for us, and we have to barge right in. But nobody ever thought beetles would fight, Leah Rossi protested mildly. Everybody thought they'd just fire a few blasts, and then— They have to fight. Orion's the last jump-off. If they don't fight here, where the hell can they fight? Rossi swore savagely. Of course they're fighting. We have all their planets except the inner Orion string— 
Not that they're worth much, but it's the principle of the thing. If we'd built up strong supply bases, we could have broken up the Beetle fleet and really clobbered it. Don't say Beetle, Tony murmured as he finished his cereal. They're Pasudeti, same as here. The word Beetle comes from Beetlejuice, an Arabian word we invented ourselves. Joe Rossi's mouth opened and closed. What are you, a goddamn Beetle lover? Joe, Leia snapped, for heaven's sake. Rossi moved toward the door. If I was ten years younger, I'd be out there. I'd really show those shiny-shelled insects what the hell they're up against. Them and their junky, beat-up old hulks. Converted freighters. His eyes blazed. When I think of them shooting down Terran cruisers with our boys in them, Orion's their system, Tony murmured. Their system? When the hell did you get to be an authority on space law? Why, I ought to. He broke off, choked with rage. My own kid he muttered. One more crack out of you today, and I'll hang one on you you'll feel the rest of the week. Tony pushed his chair back. I won't be around here today. I'm going into Carnot with my EEP. Yeah, to play with beetles. Tony said nothing. He was already sliding his helmet in place and snapping the clamps tight. As he pushed through the back door into the lock membrane, he unscrewed his oxygen tap and set the tank filter into action. An automatic response, conditioned by a lifetime spent on a colony planet in an alien system. A faint flux wind caught at him and swept yellow-red dust around his boots. Sunlight glittered from the metal roof of his family's housing unit, one of endless rows of squat boxes set in the sandy slope, protected by the line of ore-refining installations against the horizon. He made an impatient signal and from the storage shed his EEP came gliding out, catching the sunlight on its chrome trim. "'We're going down into Carnot, Tony said, unconsciously slipping into his past dialect. "'Hurry up!' The EEP took up its position behind him, and he started briskly down the slope, over the shifting sand, toward the road. There were quite a few traders out today. It was a good day for the market. Only a fourth of the year was fit for travel. Beetlejuice was an erratic and undependable son, not at all like Sol, according to the edit tapes, fed to Tony four hours a day, six days a week. He had never seen Sol himself. He reached the noisy road. Pasudeti were everywhere, whole groups of them, with their primitive combustion-driven trucks, battered and filthy, motors grinding protestingly. He waved at the trucks as they pushed past him. After a moment, one slowed down. It was piled with Tis, bundled heaps of grey vegetables, dried and prepared for the table, a staple of the Pasudeti diet. Behind the wheel lounged a dark-faced elderly pass, one arm over the open window, a rolled leaf between his lips. He was like all other Pasudeti, lank and hard-shelled, encased in a brittle sheath in which he lived and died. "'You want to ride?' the pass murmured, required protocol when an earthman on foot was encountered. Is there room for my EEP? The pass made a careless motion with his claw. It can run behind. Sardonic amusement touched his ugly old face. If it gets to Garnet, we'll sell it for scrap. We can use a few condensers and relay tubing. We're short on electronic maintenance stuff. I know, Tony said solemnly, as he climbed into the cabin of the truck. It's all been sent to the big repair base at Orion 1 for your war fleet. Amusement vanished from the leathery face. Yes, the war fleet. He turned away and started up the truck again. In the back, Tony's EP had scrambled up on the load of Tiss and was gripping precariously with its magnetic lines. Tony noticed the Pasudeti's sudden change of expression, and he was puzzled. He started to speak to him, but now he noticed unusual quietness among the other Pars, in the other trucks, behind and in front of his own. The war, of course. It had swept through this system a century ago. These people had been left behind. Now all eyes were on Orion, on the battle between the Terran Warfleet and the Parsudeti collection of armed freighters. Is it true? Tony asked carefully. That you're winning? The elderly pass grunted. We hear rumors. Tony considered. My father says Terra went ahead too fast. He says we should have consolidated. We didn't assemble adequate supply bases. He used to be an officer when he was younger. 
He was with the fleet for two years. The pass was silent a moment. It's true, he said at last, that when you're so far from home, supply is a great problem. We, on the other hand, don't have that. We have no distances to cover. Do you know anybody fighting? I have distant relatives. The answer was vague. The pass obviously didn't want to talk about it. Have you ever seen your war fleet? Not as it exists now. When the system was defeated, most of our units were wiped out. Remnants limped to Orion and joined the Orion fleet. Your relatives were with the remnants? That's right. Then you were alive when this planet was, was taken? Why do you ask? The old pass quivered violently. What business is it of yours? Tony leaned out and watched the walls and buildings of Carnot grow ahead of them. Carnot was an old city. It had stood thousands of years. The Parsudeti civilization was stable. It had reached a certain point of technocratic development and then leveled off. The pass had inter-system ships that had carried people and freight between planets in the days before the Terran Confederation. They had combustion-driven cars, audio phones, a power network of a magnetic type. Their plumbing was satisfactory, and their medicine was highly advanced. They had art forms, emotional and exciting. They had a vague religion. Who do you think will win the battle? Tony asked. I don't know. With a sudden jerk, the old pass brought the truck to a crashing halt. This is as far as I go. Please get out and take your E.P. with you. Tony faltered in surprise. But aren't you going? No, father. Tony pushed the door open. He was vaguely uneasy. There was a hard, fixed expression on the leathery face, and the old creature's voice had a sharp edge he had never heard before. Thanks, he murmured. He hopped down into the red dust and signaled his E.P. It released its magnetic lines, and instantly the truck started up with a roar, passing on inside the city. Tony watched it go, still dazed. The hot dust lapped at his ankles. He automatically moved his feet and slapped at his trousers. A truck honked, and his E.P. quickly moved him from the road up to the level pedestrian ramp. Parsudeti in swarms moved by. Endless lines of rural people hurrying into Carnot on their daily business. A massive public bus had stopped by the gate and was letting off passengers, male and female pass, and children. They laughed and shouted, the sounds of their voices blended with the low hum of the city. Going in? A sharp Parsudeti voice sounded close behind him. Keep moving, you're, you're blocking the ramp. It was a young female with a heavy armload clutched in her claws. Tony felt embarrassed. Female pars had a certain telepathic ability, part of their sexual makeup. It was effective on Earthmen at close range. Here, she said. Give me a hand. Tony nodded his head, and the E.P. accepted the female's heavy armload. I'm visiting the city, Tony said, as they moved with the crowd toward the gates. I got a ride most of the way, but... The driver let me off out here. You're from the settlement? Yes. She eyed him critically. You've always lived here, haven't you? I was born here. My family came from Earth four years before I was born. My father was an officer in the fleet. He earned an emigration priority. So you've never seen your own planet? How old are you? T ten years, Terran. You shouldn't have asked the driver so many questions. They passed through the decontamination shield and into the city. An information square loomed ahead. Past men and women were packed around it. Moving chutes and transport cars rumbled everywhere. Buildings and ramps and open-air machinery. The city was sealed in a protective dust-proof envelope. Tony unfastened his helmet and clipped it to his belt. The air was stale-smelling, artificial, but usable. Let me... Tell you something, the young female said carefully, as she strode along the foot ramp beside Tony. I wonder if this is a good day for you to come into Carnot. I know you've been coming here regularly to play with your friends, but perhaps today you ought to stay at home in your settlement. Why? Because today everybody is upset. I know, Tony said. My mother and father were upset. 
They were listening to the news from our base in the Rigel system. I don't mean your family. Other people are listening, too. These people here. My race. They're upset, all right, Tony admitted. But I come here all the same. There's nobody to play with at the settlement, and anyway, we're working on a project. A model spaceport. That's right. Tony was envious. I sure wish I was a telepath. It must be fun. The female Parsudetti was silent. She was deep in thought. What would happen, she asked, if your family left here and returned to Earth? That couldn't happen. There's no room for us on Earth. Sea bombs destroyed most of Asia and North America back in the twentieth century. Suppose you had to go back. Tony did not understand. But we can't. Habitable portions of Earth are overcrowded. Our main problem is finding places for Terrans to live in other systems. He added, And anyhow, I don't particularly want to go to Terra. I'm used to it here. All my friends are here. I'll take my packages, the female said. I go this other way, down this third level ramp. Tony nodded to his EEP, and it lowered the bundles into the female's claws. She lingered a moment, trying to find the right words. Good luck, she said. With what? She smiled faintly, ironically. With your model spaceport. I hope you and your friends get to finish it. Of course we'll finish it, Tony said, surprised. It, it's almost done. What did she mean? The Parsudetti woman hurried off before he could ask her. Tony was troubled and uncertain. More doubts filled him. After a moment, he headed slowly into the lane that took him toward the residential section of the city, past the stores and factories, to the place where his friends lived. The group of Parsudetti children eyed him silently as he approached. They had been playing in the shade of an immense hengalo, whose ancient branches drooped and swayed with the air currents pumped through the city. Now they sat unmoving. "'I didn't expect you today,' the Prith said in an expressionless voice. Tony halted awkwardly, and his EEP did the same. "'How are things?' he murmured. "'Fine. I got a ride part way. Fine.' Tony squatted down in the shade. None of the past children stirred. They were small, not as large as Terran children. Their shells had not hardened, had not turned dark and opaque like fawn. It gave them a soft, unformed appearance but at the same time it lightened their load. They moved more easily than their elders. They could hop and skip around still, but they were not skipping right now. "'What's the matter?' Tony demanded. "'What's wrong with everybody?' No one answered. "'Where's the model?' he asked. "'Have you fellows been working on it?' After a moment, Lyre nodded slightly. Tony felt dull anger rise up inside him. "'Say something. What's the matter?' What are you all mad about? Mad? The Prith echoed. We're not mad. Tony scratched aimlessly in the dust. He knew what it was. The war again. The battle going on near Orion. His anger burst up wildly. Forget the war. Everything was fine yesterday before the battle. Sure, Lyre said. It was fine. Tony caught the edge to his voice. It happened a hundred years ago. It's not my fault. Sure, the Prith said. This is my home, isn't it? Haven't I got as much right here as anybody else? I was born here. Sure, Lyre said, tonelessly. Tony appealed to them helplessly. Do you have to act this way? You, you didn't act this way yesterday. I was here yesterday. All of us were here yesterday. What's happened since yesterday? The battle the Prith said. What difference does that make? Why does that change everything? There's always war. There have been battles all the time as long as I can remember. What's different about this? The Prith broke apart a clump of dirt with his strong claws. After a moment, he tossed it away and got slowly to his feet. Well, he said thoughtfully, according to our audio relay, it looks as if our fleet is going to win this time. Yes, Tony agreed, not understanding. My father says we didn't build up adequate supply bases. We'll probably have to fall back to— And then the impact hit him. 
You mean, for the first time in a hundred years? Yes, Lyre said, also getting up. The others got up, too. They moved away from Tony, toward the nearby house. We're winning. The Terran flank was turned half an hour ago. Your right wing has folded completely. Tony was stunned. And it matters. It matters to all of you. Matters? The Prith halted, suddenly blazing out in fury. Sure it matters. For the first time in a century. The first time in our lives we beating you. We have you on the run, you— He choked out the word, almost spat it out. You white grubs! They disappeared into the house. Tony sat gazing stupidly down at the ground, his hand still moving aimlessly. He had heard the word before, seen it scrawled on walls and in the dust near the settlement. White grubs. The past term of derision for Terrans. Because of their softness, their whiteness, Lack of hard shells, pulpy, doughy skin. But they had never dared say it out loud before, to an Earthman's face. Beside him, his EP stirred restlessly. Its intricate radio mechanism sensed the hostile atmosphere. Automatic relays were sliding into place, circuits were opening and closing. It's, it's all right, Tony murmured, getting slowly up. Maybe we'd better go back. He moved unsteadily toward the ramp, completely shaken. The EEP walked calmly ahead, its metal face blank and confident, feeling nothing, saying nothing. Tony's thoughts were a wild turmoil. He shook his head, but the crazy spinning kept up. He couldn't make his mind slow down, lock in place. Wait a minute, a voice said, a Prith's voice from the open doorway, cold and withdrawn, almost unfamiliar. What do you want? The Prith came toward him, claws behind his back in the formal Parsudeti posture, used between total strangers. You shouldn't have come here today. I know, Tony said. The Prith got out a bit of tis stalk and began to roll it into a tube. He pretended to concentrate on it. Look, he said. You said you have a right here, but you don't. Uh, I— Tony murmured. You understand why not? You said it isn't your fault. I guess not. But it's not my fault either. Maybe it's nobody's fault. I've known you a long time. Five years, Terran. The Prith twisted the stalk up and tossed it away. Yesterday we played together. We worked on the spaceport, but we can't play today. My family said to tell you not to come here any more. He hesitated and did not look Tony in the face. I was going to tell you anyhow, before they said anything. Oh, Tony said. Everything that's happened today, the battle, our fleet stand, we didn't know. We didn't dare hope, you see. A century of running. First this system, then the Rigel system, all the planets, and then the other Orion stars. We fought here and there, scattered fights. Those that got away joined up. We supplied the base at Orion. You people didn't know. But there was no hope. At least nobody thought there was. He was silent a moment. Funny, he said. What happens when your back's to the wall and there isn't any further place to go? Then you have to fight. If our supply bases— Tony began thickly, but Beprith cut him off savagely. Your supply bases, don't you understand? We're beating you. Now you'll have to get out, all you white grubs, out of our system. Tony's E.P. moved forward ominously. The Prith saw it. He bent down, snatched up a rock, and hurled it straight at the E.P. The rock clanged off the metal hull and bounced harmlessly away. The Prith snatched up another rock. Lyre and the others came quickly out of the house. An adult pass loomed up behind them. Everything was happening too fast. More rocks crashed against the E.P. One struck Tony on the arm. Get out! The Prith screamed. Don't come back! This is our planet! His claws snatched at Tony. We'll tear you to pieces if you— Tony smashed him in the chest. The soft shell gave like rubber, and the pass stumbled back. He wobbled and fell over, gasping and screeching. Beetle, Tony breathed hoarsely. Suddenly he was terrified. A crowd of Parsudeti was forming rapidly. 
They surged on all sides, hostile faces, dark and angry, a rising thunder of rage. More stones showered. Some struck the E.P. Others fell around Tony, near his boots. One whizzed past his face. Quickly, he slid his helmet in place. He was scared. He knew his E.E.P.'s E-signal had already gone out, but it would be minutes before a ship could come. Besides, there were other Earthmen in the city to be taken care of. There were Earthmen all over the planet, in all the cities, on all the twenty-three Betelgeuse planets, on the fourteen Rigel planets, on the other Orion planets. We have to get out of here, he muttered to the E.E.P. Do something! A stone hit him on the helmet. The plastic cracked, air leaked out and then the auto-seal filmed over. More stones were falling. The pass warmed close, a yelling, seething mass of black-sheathed creatures. He could smell them, the acrid body odor of insects, hear their claws snap, feel their weight. The EP threw its heat beam on. The beam shifted in a wide band toward the crowd of Parsudeti. Crude hand weapons appeared. A clatter of bullets burst around Tony. They were firing at the E.P. He was dimly aware of the metal body beside him. A shuddering crash. The E.P. was toppled over. The crowd poured over it. The metal hull was lost from sight. Like a demented animal, the crowd tore at the struggling E.P. A few of them smashed in its head. Others tore off struts and shiny arm sections. The E.P. ceased struggling. The crowd moved away, panting and clutching jagged remains. They saw Tony. As the first line of them reached for him, the protective envelope high above them shattered. A Terran scout ship thundered down, heat beams screaming. The crowd scattered in confusion, some firing, some throwing stones, others leaping for safety. Tony picked himself up and made his way unsteadily toward the spot where the scout was landing. I'm sorry, Joe Rossi said gently. He touched his son on the shoulder. I shouldn't have let you go down there today. I, I should have known. Tony sat hunched over in the big plastic easy chair. He rocked back and forth, face pale with shock. The scout ship which had rescued him had immediately headed back toward Carnot. There were other Earthmen to bring out, besides this first load. The boy said nothing. His mind was blank. He still heard the roar of the crowd, felt its hate, a century of pent-up fury and resentment. The memory drove out everything else. It was all around him, even now, and the sight of the floundering E.P., the metallic ripping sound as its arms and legs were torn off and carried away. His mother dabbed at his cuts and scratches with antiseptic. Joe Rossi shakily lit a cigarette and said, If your E.P. hadn't been along, they'd have killed you. Beetles. He shuddered. I never should have let you go down there, all this time. They might have done it at any time, any day, knifed you, cut you open with their filthy goddamn claws. Below the settlement, the reddish yellow sunlight glinted on gun barrels. Already, dull booms echoed against the crumbling hills. The defense ring was going into action. Black shapes darted and scurried up the side of the slope. Black patches moved out from Carnot, toward the Terran settlement, across the dividing line the Confederation surveyors had set up a century ago. Carnot was a bubbling pot of activity. The whole city rumbled with feverish excitement. Tony raised his head. They… they turned our flank. Yeah. Joe Rossi stubbed out his cigarette. They sure did. That was at one o'clock. At two they drove a wedge right through the center of our line split the fleet in half, broke it up, sent it running, picked us off one by one as we fell back. Christ, they're like maniacs. Now that they've got the scent, the taste of our blood. But it's getting better, Leia fluttered. Our main fleet units are beginning to appear. We'll get them, Joe muttered. It'll take a while, but by God we'll wipe them out, every last one of them. If it takes a thousand years, we'll follow every last ship down. We'll get them all. Beetles, goddamn insects, when I think of them trying to hurt my kid with their filthy black claws. If you were younger, you'd be in the line, Leia said. It's not your fault you're too old. The heart strain's too great. You did your job. They can't let an older person take chances. It's not your fault. 
Joe clenched his fists. I feel so futile. If, if there was only something I could do. The fleet will take care of them, Leia said soothingly. You said so yourself. They'll hunt every one of them down, destroy them all. There's nothing to worry about. Joe sagged miserably. It's no use. Let's cut it out. Let's, let's stop kidding ourselves. What do you mean? Face it, we're not going to win. Not this time. We went too far. Our time's come. There was silence. Tony sat up a little. When did you know? I've known a long time. I found out today. I didn't understand at first. This is stolen ground. I was born here, but it's stolen ground. Yes, it's stolen. It doesn't belong to us. We're here because we're stronger. But now we're not stronger. We're being beaten. They know Tarans can be licked like anybody else. Joe Rossi's face was grey and flabby. We took their planets away from them. Now they're taking them back. It'll be a while, of course. We'll retreat slowly. It'll be another five centuries going back. There are a lot of systems between here and Sol. Tony shook his head, still uncomprehending. Even Lyre and Beprith, all of them, waiting for their time to come, for us to lose and go away again, where where we came from. Joe Rossi paced back and forth. Yeah, we'll be retreating from now on, giving ground instead of taking it. It'll be like this today, losing fights, draws, stalemates, and worse. He raised his feverish eyes toward the ceiling of the little metal housing unit, face wild with passion and misery. But by God, we'll give them a run for their money, all the way back, every inch.